Good evening. I believe I'm streaming live, but here we are. Okay, uh, good evening. It seems none of my panelists have joined this evening as yet. And although one said she might come later. And so I'm just going to go ahead with the 158th meeting of the Carl Jung Depth Psychology Reading Group. And uh, by popular demand, I've agreed to go back to do some simple things. Hello, Chisai. Chisai Otako. Oh, how goes I was? Surprise, surprise. So I'm talking this evening about Memories, Dreams, Reflections, which is the book that apparently, uh, the book that serves as Dr. Jung's um, memoirs, or uh, not memoirs, but autobiography, except it's an autobiography of his psyche. And uh, since I don't have any of my panelists here, I was hoping that they would come, but um, we can talk through the, the YouTube chat. And uh, let's see. So Chisai said she got into psychology because of BTS. Uh, Subarashi. Watachi, uh, watachi wa eroko desu. Did you know that? Anyway, um, so Chisai Otaku, I don't know if you're in Japan, but uh, Chisai means small and uh, I don't remember what otaku means, but anyway. Um, and good evening, Art. Nice to see you. Uh, so far, I'm doing well. Okay, so I'm going to start with the prologue of Memories, Dreams, Reflections. And uh, Sugoi, Invisible Man, also has a little Japanese. Suurashi. Um, and uh, so in the prologue, right at the very beginning, uh, Dr. Jung has a couple of very, uh, let's call them pregnant or important uh, sentences that need to be re reflected here. So I'm working with Memories, Dreams, Reflections, uh, edited by Aniela Yaffe, and it is what up until now has passed as the uh, memoir of C.G. Jung. And it's a memoir of the development of his personality and psyche. And so the very first sentence uh, sort of sums up everything we need to know about uh, individuation. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> um, my life is a story of the self-realization of the unconscious. So basically that's what he's talking about throughout his career. And the bottom line idea of most of Dr. Jung's work, almost all of Dr. Jung's work is the idea of individuation. And so, um, when he talks about, just try to get this, um, when he says self-realization of the unconscious, what he's saying is that all of us have within us unconscious pressures which need to want to be, need to be realized. And uh, so I've said many times that Individuation is sort of like the equivalent of, let's say an oak tree. An oak tree would be an example. In fact, all 
creatures individuate in this sense that an oak tree has everything in it it needs to become an oak tree. A chicken, when it's in its egg, has everything it needs in that egg to become a chicken and to become a fully grown chicken, not just a little chick coming out of the egg. And so we have that too. So there are certain features about the human being that are common to all of us. So, you know, we would always recognize a human being, whether they live in Central Africa or they live wherever. And, but every human being is different. And so every oak tree is different. So the oak tree knows how to Sorry, I have some sort of timer on this light that keeps shutting off on me. I don't know why. That's my show and tell that fell on the ground. Ah, hello, Jerome. Now I don't have to talk to myself anymore. Uh, oh, good. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you. I had trouble getting on, so anyway. Okay, well, we all have these problems. Uh, so anyway, I was just talking about individuation because the first sentence of the pro prologue of MDR really sums up individuation. And it's the self-realization of the unconscious. So the oak tree or any other being, let's say, knows how to become that being, but they know it unconsciously, and most of them have no consciousness and no awareness whatsoever. It just happens that we, uh, in our species, we do have awareness of it, but your psyche is unconsciously telling your heart to beat 72 times a minute and your breath to be taken 12 times a minute and it's replacing all your cells once every seven years and all all these things happen automatically and so when dr young is talking about his life story this is what he's talking about that that he became what he was intended to be and each of us become what we are intended to be. Um, and is that fair enough, Jerome? Yeah, it's kind of, it's built into us and we're supposed to become that. And the problem right. is, is when we get stuck. Yeah, the problem is we, we don't know it and we get stuck because we're, we're trying to become something else maybe. And, and that can lead to neuroses and, and so on. And yeah, it's kind of like becoming something you're not. And so sure. you, you need to really get in touch with, uh, you know, what am I built to do? What, what is my passions? What am I built for? And pursue that effort uh, instead of uh, maybe, you know, there's all sorts of reasons why we're forced not to be right. that way. Okay, so for example, um, a young man ha has courage typically, but um, you know sometimes they're not meant for something. Like I joined the high school football team when I was in the 10th grade. Um, I also did it in the eighth, but in high school, I did it in the 10th grade. And I already knew that I couldn't run very fast and I couldn't throw. So I tried to play outside tackle, which is a line position. The only problem with that was um, I weighed 125 pounds and the average of the team in high school was 164 pounds. And the heaviest guy on the team was 195 pounds. So I wasn't really in a position to stop much of anybody. Uh, I did stick it out throughout the 
the season and went to practice every day and all that. Uh, I think I only got into one game for like two minutes <laughs> one time, but I at least practiced with the team. And so I got bowled over many times, but what I learned was that I wasn't cut out for football, but that doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean anything except I was under size for the football team because later I went out for the Marines and became a Marine and did the whole thing. So it wasn't a matter of courage. It was a matter of, I wasn't intended to be a football player. <laughs> and there are a lot of, there are a number of reasons for that, but uh, I never could have been a football player, but, uh, and my, but my father, wisely let me find that out for myself, I guess. And so Jung goes on, everything in the unconscious seeks outward manifestation and the personality too desires to evolve out of its unconscious conditions and to experience itself as a whole. So our unconscious is trying to experience everything we can be. And so the army has a has a motto, um, be all you can be. And, and that's what individuation means. It means be, becoming what you can become. Because if you don't do that, you're going to have a, you're going to be dissatisfied in life if you don't at least try to do it. And if you fail, fine, then you go on to something else. And eventually it's just, it's, uh, it's a bit like bumper cars or something like that. You go around the, you go around the lap a few times, maybe all right, but then somebody bangs you, and then you have to start. You have to start going in a different direction, and so uh, that's what Dr. Young is talking about in this section, and. He says, the only question is whether what I tell is my fable, my truth. And so yesterday I read about uh, Isdabar from the Red Book and um, Isdabar asked Dr. Young if there's more than one truth. And the, the truth is there's more than seven and a half billion truths on the, on the planet and, and you're one of them. And so the question is finding your truth. What is uh, true for you? Now, he also, in this prologue, um, sort of telegraphs the fact that his life was largely about religion. And it took me the longest time to figure out what, that that was the case. I mean, I always thought that he was a psychiatrist and, um, and I thought his collected works were about clinical psychology. Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> because it's, it's very largely about religion and spiritual, the spiritual path. And he telegraphs that right in the beginning of this prologue of Mem Memories, Dreams, Reflections. But most of us wouldn't even notice that if you read the book, if you read the book, because he says, I am a splinter of the infinite deity, but I cannot contrast myself with any animal, any plant or any stone. So, so he's saying he is a part of the infinite deity. And in essence, right at the, well, this was written at the end of his life, but he was realizing right from the beginning that uh, he had the divine in him and it was, and he was part of it and it was part of him. I guess that would be the way to put it. Feel free to pipe up here anytime, Jerome. Yeah, well, I was, I was surprised about the, uh, his religious upbringing with his father being a pastor and uh, and yeah. the troubles, the troubles he encountered with that. Uh, yeah, he didn't. He didn't like being around religion, 
and he didn't know why and it he basically took 60 years to figure it out <laughs> at least 60 years well there, there yeah there's a big disconnect between what he saw them saying and what he was experiencing himself he was already experiencing himself as being part of a bigger entity the, even though he was just a slice of it which we right. all are you know sure well he he understood that he had a there was a spiritual being that was part of him um and it was part of his personality number two so right away in this book he starts talking about personality number one and personality number two and what you figure out over time is that personality number one is his ego and later he defines personality number two as his self um and um i don't know jerome you've watched uh Paul Vanderclay a few times. Do you have a clear idea about what he means by God number one and God number two when he starts saying that? No, it, it's not what I would think of it as being that. Um, I, I would think Young's God number two is, uh, and I can relate to that because as a child, I was really the number two. And it's, it's kind of a delay in development, I think because you're you're seeing uh, the uh, the infinite and yet you're having trouble uh, adjusting and developing number one and it mm -hmm. takes a while to develop number one but you do right but it's very difficult because what you're seeing is is just not it's not you know you hear things and like I went to when I went to church and I was sitting in the back of the uh, sanctuary yeah and there were some uh, black people that came in mm -hmm. and the uh, usher ushered them out right after uh, the preacher was saying well god loves everyone come on come on you know <laughs> and i said this is uh, no i just quit right then uh -huh. walked out and yeah. i just the hypocrisy was just i could not stand it mm-hmm it was just not right and that's why i made that decision so. yeah that's very interesting um boy it's amazing what what our country has been through with all that uh, stuff over the years um, and i think what interests me most is not individual individuation, but the individuation of the country. And we are seeing that um, very clearly in our current affairs where the country is, is trying to become, become something, but we're having a hard time getting past our past as many people do in their individual lives. We, you know, our parents abuse us or something like that and we um, and then we have stunted development for some reason something like that and we, uh, pardon yeah and we don't uh we're not furnishing people with a roadmap of uh, of what could be done in case they run into the situations like this and i think that's what you know, what Young was trying to do is develop a roadmap for people and so they could understand that, uh, hey, you're not the only one that can go through this, but here's some things to do and not do. Right, uh, right. Well, Will of Earth says, psychology is the study of the soul. True psychology is spiritual. Uh, yeah, I think that's right. And one of the things that we get into here is how Dr. Young was just anathema toward mathematics because he said that you can't tell anything really about a person based on statistics for example uh, because okay you see me on the screen or jerome on the screen and you say well these are white men so 
95% of white men do X and, and think Y and so on. And you can get all these percentages, statistics. But what that does only is tell you an average. It really doesn't tell me anything, tell you anything about me. Um, and, and so that's why he wouldn't accept statistics in his lifetime. He believed that each person had to, we had to look into each person's inner self individually. Um, and yeah, the invisible man says, seems that we have a sense of spiritual being, but that is internal, how to find ourself in the external world. Uh, uh, um, I, I was just looking at the comment before that, which is from ja Jackie Jean, which says, how in Chinese characters, I guess. Uh, so Jackie Jean is also communicating in, uh, <laughs> in, in an Oriental language, which I know something about. And, uh, and that happens to be one of the characters that I recognize still after 45 or however long it was ago, almost 50 years since I studied Chinese. Um, yeah, and, well, I was, I was thinking about what you said about the math thing. Yes. And uh, uh, I had uh, trouble with math, but it was uh, because, you know, Young said you could memorize these things to do number of steps and follow them and get the answer. And he memorized mm. those. Mm. I had trouble memorizing stuff, but I could see the solution. And I actually got charged with cheating because I could figure out the math without doing all the step by steps, mm -hmm. you know. And then eventually, uh, the, you know, the math teachers didn't know what to do. But eventually I did learn math but I, I think of it in a different way they could not teach math the way that i understood it so yeah you that, must that, you must also be quite intuitive i guess because that's what happened to me i mean when we started long division in the fourth grade i could just see the answer i could close my eyes and see the answer i didn't have to do any math <laughs> I, I could see the problem and I could see what the answer was. I knew what the answer was. Yeah, and then it didn't make any sense about what they were doing to get the answer. And I was going, why are they doing that? You know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that, that's just uh, a couple of crazy old coots here on the webinar <laughs> talking about the way we learn. But, you know, my wife never got math and uh, she never really worried about it. Uh, she did graduate Phi Beta Kappa from her college class, so I guess she didn't need it. Um, and so let's see. Um, so Dr. Young also was having uh, lots of bouts with his unconscious, and these were indelibly engraved in his mind. And so we're starting with his his baby years and his school years. And so in this prologue, he's talking about um, the fact that the external events he's, he just lost interest in, but the things that were from his unconscious were the most powerful. And, and as I look back on the types of events that are discussed here, in my own life, I realized that number one, they tended to be involved with a trauma, number one. And number two, um, they were psychological issues and they're the only things I remember, basically. Um, and uh, so, Anyway, we can we can talk about some of those. Um, yeah, well, I was thinking uh, 
you know, when I was a kid, we're going back in time here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for both of us. Yeah, quite a ways. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, I used to uh, sit around and I would play with sticks and build little forts and right. knock them down, kind of like what he would do. And I really enjoyed being in nature. We, mm -hmm. I spent all the time outside and uh, we would play and do stuff like that. But yeah. I also uh, like to draw and I would draw uh, pictures and things like that and designs and so forth. So I really enjoyed doing that. So that's how I entertained myself. But... Yeah, and my drawing was limited to the five pointed star, but every one of my books, if I go through any of my books, you'll find a five pointed star. Like if I op just open a page randomly, <laughs> you'll see. Yeah five five pointed stars that i've put there for for uh reminding me now art says um let's see right okay so art asks the question how do, how does dream how do dreams affect us in our lives and dan correctly says that dreams are really messages from our unconscious dreams and visions are so they're um, they can be warnings, they can be advice, they can be all kinds of things. And the reason that you can't buy a, a book that interprets dreams is a, a symbol will mean something to a lot of people. Let's say that 95% of everybody might think of a star as a symbolic of something or the moon or what what have you but five percent won't <laughs> and and then it could mean anything and um you know it's just it, oh, it's, but the but the images do not uh when when they come at us uh, there's no language it, they're not in our language that we speak that's right and we have to interpret them but not right. in our language right uh, we have we have to understand what what our psyche is trying to tell us right because, and it's a universal language right it's, uh, it's just that we uh, and that's the reason to write the dreams down so that you can uh, and draw the verb you know, just whatever you want to do to keep the dream journal. Uh, right. So I wonder how many people in on the chat have actually read these pages. Um, so in in these pages, um, which are first years and school years, that's what we assigned for tonight for discussion. Uh, Dr. Young is talking about a lot of experiences of growing up that's the book which uh, jerome is holding up memory streams reflections and if we go to page six chapter one chapter one and chapter two tonight and chapter one is first year so he's describing very early uh experiences that he can remember and uh, I don't know. You want to go first, Jerome, or you want me to go first? <laughs> uh, go ahead. I dropped my book. <laughs> okay. So um, uh, what I can remember um, one time, I, I just can remember a very dark time in a courtyard that was between apartment buildings where we lived in Norfolk, Virginia when uh, my father was probably at sea, I guess. And um, so my mother had an inexpensive apartment that had been made available by the Navy. And I was two years old. And uh, my, as my mother told this story that one of our neighbors had a two-year-old son also. Um, his name was Michael Todd, believe it or not. Um, not the Michael Todd of movie fame, by the way. Uh, but anyway, Michael Todd, his mother had read a, a, psychology, a child psychology book that said at the age of two, a boy should have a hammer. 
So she gives him his father's hammer. And what I remember about this is when he was, he attacked me with his hammer. And I don't remember seeing him, but I remember being forced basically down to the ground and I, there was blood around <laughs> and so on. And uh, my, my mother screamed, all the women, because it was a courtyard, the like eight apartments looked into this courtyard. And fortunately there was a Navy commander who was still at home that day. And his wife shouted at her husband that Michael was killing Skipper with a hammer. And uh, so he came running out in his skibbies and grabbed the hammer and ran back in the house. And then my mother took me to the hospital where I had to have a few stitches. And unlike Dr. Young, whose stitches were, or his, whose scar was showing until the end of his high school, I think if you look in the back of my head, you'll still see uh, some scars from that time. Um, but another trauma has to do with this statue. Okay, and so I brought a show and tell. Th this statue is called Aphrodite of Rhodes. And um, the reason I have it is a, a bit of a long story, but uh, my father had been um, assigned to a destroyer in the Mediterranean. Um, and this was, this would have been in 1949. And he visited Rhodes and while he was in Rhodes, he found this statue, except not this statue, but he found another version of this statue. And he really liked it. So he brought it home as a gift for my mother. And so I must have been three years old. My brother was one year old. Uh, and my mother was thrilled with this statue and she put it on a, tele, a telephone stand that was in the hallway of our apartment. And my brother who was, I don't know, eight or 10 months old. So he was just starting to crawl and, and maybe to stand up on furniture uh, comes over and he rattles this telephone stand. The statue comes falling down and broke into a million pieces or a thousand pieces, whatever. And so my mother was crushed and I can still remember this. I mean, she was weeping and, um, and she knew it wasn't my brother's fault, but anyway, she spent all night putting this statue back together, gluing it back together, which wasn't very possible, but she did. She puts it back on the telephone stand again, and my brother took it out again almost immediately, and it broke into a thousand pieces again. So she swept it up and put it in the garbage. And so um, in 2004, then, which is what? 55 years later, uh, Debbie and I were going to um, Greece to, uh, we just had an opportunity to spend some time in Greece and it happened to be the Olympic year uh, for Athens. And so we were gonna go and my mother said, well, if you see this statue, uh, would you get me a copy of it? And she described it with the, the the woman washing her hair, basically, and that's not exactly how she described it, but she uh, described it well enough so that I could see it and, or, you know, get some idea of it. So when I was in Athens, I went to a curio shop where they had lots of statues of different kinds, and I couldn't find the statue, but I asked, I happened to ask the proprietor and he had a catalog of these things. And he said, is it this one? And he showed, it, showed me this one. And uh, I said, that must be it for sure. And 
So I bought two copies, one for my mother and one for me and brought it back in 2004. And my mother was, she was really touched. I mean, incredibly touched. And, and uh, she put it on her counter and had it for the rest of her life. Um, but it's, it's a very significant uh, thing for me because it has that whole story around it. And then um, about 2004, 2005, I too went to Rhodes and I learned that this statue is actually Aphrodite of Rhodes. And Aphrodite of Rhodes was found um, in the harbor of Rhodes by a fisherman in about 100 AD. And it was literally fished up. It was pulled up in a fishing net. And uh, it's one of the chief uh, things that you can see in the Museum of Rhodes. Uh, but I did not see it because all the museums were closed. We were there uh, three months before the Olympics or something, and they were renovating all the all the places. So I didn't get to actually see Aphrodite of Rhodes, but I still have her. So there she is. And the original Aphrodite of Rhodes was, I think, much bigger than this. I think the original is like three feet tall or so. And she was when first discovered, uh, they, when they fished her up out of the harbor, um, she was covered with seaweed and so on. And uh, they found many, many, many statues in Rhodes. It's a very interesting place to visit because uh, the Crusaders had a, had a fort in Rhodes. Uh, it was the hospitalers who, uh, who had it. But anyway, um, so from my third year, when I, I can still remember my brother crawling across the floor and grabbing his telephone stand after he destroyed the thing the night before. I still remember that incident very clearly. Um, and so that was one of my early ones. Your turn, Jerome. Can't hear you. It'd be better if I turn the microphone yep. on. That's better, yeah. <laughs> anyway, was the statue marble that uh, they pulled out? Uh, uh, yes, the name? original one is marble. I think this is marble composite or something. Mm -hmm. I, I think they've molded this one. It's not a carved marble, but... Um, yeah, yeah to, to see the museum version would be great if you... Uh, yeah. Of the artist, but it, it does it does say across the bottom in Greek, I think Aphrodite of Rhodes, right across here. Actually, I can probably look up the Greek and and be sure, but um, because I happen to have the have the um, Greek alphabet here, just for grins. <laughs> but anyway, it's a it's a great statue and. Uh, it means a lot to me and it sits on my wife's uh, dresser uh, to this day. So. Uh, there's something in the chat here from Brendan Walls. Oh, I don't see Brendan. Oh, Rick. here. Oh, okay. Hi, Brendan. Let me get you in here. Yeah, he says, what are we taking turns on? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, let me get you into the... Uh, okay, so Brendan is coming in. Should be here. Okay, okay. there he is. Hello, Brendan. So, you're, you're live. <laughs> uh, Tim Holmes. And there's is, Tim. Okay. Yeah. Welcome, Tim. Uh, let me see if I can get you in. There you are. Well, there's there's Brandon. And there's Tim. So well, not Tim, not yet, but <laughs> Howdy. Uh Brendan, Hi. it looks like you have a cover over your camera or something. It's the no, it's the yeah. shelf of of uh, I put you on a bookcase. Oh so I see. Okay. Put you I know you're still the same thing, yeah. Let right, right. Somewhere else. I don't want to put yeah. you in front of the here. I'll put you in a drawer. 
Okay. I I have this little cur cover for my phone and I sometimes accidentally leave it down like that. So <laughs> that's what I thought I yeah. was seeing there. There's Tim. So Hi Tim. How are you doing? Hey, Tim. So we're we're talking about early experiences, gentlemen. And what what caused us to be sort of, what are the things that we remember? And my observation was the things that I remembered were traumatic, uh, trauma type things. And so I, have, Tim, you might be interested in this. I was showing Aphrodite of Rhodes, which. Yeah, I heard your story about that. Yeah, so. Yeah, I, any, anyway, go ahead, Brendan. Well, uh, it's interesting that uh, your earliest memories were related to um, tough times for you and your mother also. And my mm -hmm. earliest memory is one of uh, having been hospitalized for um, a, um, an anal problem or a rectal problem. Um, and I don't know how long I was in hospital. Uh, it can't have been too long. But anyway, my um, only memories of the incident are uh, coming up the hospital steps with the ambulance men in a gurney and uh, dragging myself, uh, well, three memories, um, being looked over and, and looked after by a wonderful uh, uh, nurse in white with ginger hair. And I don't remember much else about her, but she just was lovely. And um, then the other memory I have is dragging myself, crawling to the end of the ward, the children's ward, where there was a big bay window and um, having to um, say goodbye to my mother because of course in those days uh, you couldn't get many visits and uh, they wouldn't be very long mm -hmm. so um, it must have been a tough time for her to see her child in hospital although she had a bunch of us who ended up going to hospital for one thing or another and it certainly was a tough time for me mm -hmm. to have to be stuck in hospital with relative strangers and my own mother being um you know, gone off into the distance. Yeah, how, how old do you think you were? I know I was three at the time. I see, okay. Um, Tim, do you have uh, early memories you wanna share? My, my first memory is a very archetypal, strange experience. I was uh, born in Rapid City, South Dakota and I believe my grandparents were visiting. And there was a place south of town where there was a, some kind of a buffalo reserve. And I remember this very clear experience of being in the back of my grandmother's car, which is a 49 Dodge or something like that. One of those old kind of bulbous cars right and and I remember the texture of the of the fabric and everything and looking out the window at a bison that was maybe 20 feet away mm -hmm. and the bison looks at me and all of a sudden I see this huge Cheshire cat grin on the bison's face and it <laughs> absolutely terrified me and I dove down into the seat and I said you've got to get me out of here right of course, I look at that now and I think, well, that's just ridiculous. You know, that would never happen. But that's my memory. <laughs> uh, that's interesting. Well, I, I have some memories, but I couldn't possibly have them. But my mother was a good storyteller. And one of her uh, dicta was, uh, if, uh, if it's not true, it ought to be. And so I have a I have a memory, but I think I'm sure it has to be from um, from a story my mother told because um, I was born in Biloxi, Mississippi, believe it or not. My father was assigned to the CB base that's there. And um, I, uh, well, actually, I, I was born in Biloxi, which has Keesler Air Force Base, but it was an Army Air Force Base at that time. And um, my father, who was in the Navy, was assigned in Gulfport. And 
So a couple of things that my mother used to complain about. One was that she was pregnant with me in the very hot summer of 1946. And so she would sit out on the porch of this house and the woman, it was a duplex and the woman who owned the place kept chickens and she, and she would, uh, when she wanted to have chickens for dinner, chicken for dinner, she'd go out and, and with her cleaver, whack the head off of the chicken. And then she'd throw it out of, out into the yard and let it run around until it collapsed, right? Bleeding everywhere. And uh, frightening the children with these, these headless chickens. And um, my mother was such a good storyteller. I couldn't possibly remember this because we <laughs> le left there when I was like six months old. But my mother was such a good storyteller that I have a memory of that, of that experience. <laughs> and so it was just weird. Anyway, carrying on. Anything else we want to talk about here? We're talking about early experience and and how we come into consciousness, I suppose, is what Dr. Jung was trying to drive at in these first years talks he what he was at. You know, in re reading Memories, Dreams, Reflections, I came across a description Jung made that I had never heard before, but was part of my experience as a little kid, probably four years old. Uh, I remember getting sick and having this amazing experience of lying in my bed and suddenly feeling like my body is as big as the room. Uh. And then collapsing into this tiny creature that was maybe the size of a mouse. Hmm. And it so alarmed me that this kept happening over and over, but I never could make any sense of it. I just figured, well, that's, you know, part of the bizarre response of the human brain to disease or something like that. Mm -hmm. But then in memories, dreams, reflections, he talked about the same thing happening to him when he was a kid and got sick. And I've always been really curious about that. I've never heard of that happening to anybody else. Yeah. Does that sound familiar to any of you? Well, it certainly does. And um, I mean, just in general terms, I'd say that that did. I, I had a lot of uncanny dreams uh, when I was young, under five. And one time I, we were living on the Mojave Desert in California. And um, the there's a naval ordnance testing station there in case you're wondering why I was on the desert. And um, my grandparents were coming by train to visit. And so, you know, they had like a four day trip across the country by train. But on the day before they arrived, um, I had this dream of being in bed and from my feet toward toward me along the edge of the of the bed a train was coming toward me a little train like a like a toy train and this was the the dream and i'm sure in earlier days that was probably a snake dream i suppose i, I suspect that was a snake dream um what's but, a snake dream well hu humans all have snake dreams because the snake was the predator for us in the, when we were still living in the trees. <laughs> and, and they, so it's a very, very deep archetypal uh, vision that humans often have. Yeah, it's an imprint is what I would call it. Right. And of course, I've mentioned several times, and I, I'm not going to go into it at great length, but that I had a dream of a dinosaur when I was six years old that I could not possibly have seen. And I have a hypothesis, it's probably good for a PhD thesis by somebody who might be listening, that 
my hypothesis is that that image came through to me from several hundred million years ago or tens of millions of years ago at least um and so long before there were it was a human species and that young children still have dreams of dinosaurs even today and that's why we dinosaur toys are so popular because people use the toy to tell the kid oh it's only this thing it's no big thing it's you know there're no it's not real it's not here you know so if you have a dream about a dinosaur don't worry about it and of course these days it's like dr young and the and the um um the alchemists before epistemo epistemological criticism so i was that age at a time when there were, were no dinosaur toys that i had no way of ever seeing a picture of a dinosaur i mean i had this vision in kodiak now it was constellated by an early version of jurassic park which was uh shown at, at the officers club in a in a uh, movie one night and i had this dream within uh within a week of of seeing that film but that film had a tyrannosaurus rex in it and the dinosaur i had in my dream was completely different and so so that the image of that dinosaur had to be an imprint also uh and in my opinion <laughs> you probably you probably knew what the real dinosaur looked like as opposed to the Jurassic Park. So. Well, that, that's right. I mean, I, obviously, the the one that was in the black and white movie was uh, was a mechanical monster <laughs> that, that some movie company made, and this would have been in nineteen fifty one or fifty two or fifty three, something like that. Um, can you talk? Can you talk, Skip? about the significance of dreams of death? Um, the dreams of dying, the dreams of, of dying in various ways. Well, I certainly, okay. I mean, dreams are often very, um, vivid and scary. Mm -hmm. because our psyche is trying to get our attention okay and so i can i can i have some examples of that where uh, when i was 40 i was unemployed for two years and uh it was really it was really troubling i i was living with debbie but i couldn't find a job um other than I could do my re Marine Corps Reserve stuff, and that was a boon, but but I couldn't find a regular job. And here I was, a lawyer MBA, Japanese Chinese speaking lawyer MBA with five years experience building a company in Japan and three years more in Japan in high school. So I had a lot of experience and I came to Washington assuming that it would be easy for me to get a job. I was 39 years old and I just couldn't. Um, it just it just didn't work that way. <laughs> and um, I finally did get a job, but it took two years and I ended up being a professor of finance, believe it or not, uh, at the University of Maryland for a couple of years in the graduate school. But um, during that two year period, I had, I must have had 20 different dreams about being executed by every possible means, electrocution, beheading, uh, firing squad, hanging, you name it. I'd have a dream about that. And, you know, finally I realized that you know, my psyche is trying to tell me, hey, man, you got to get a job. And I say, OK, thank you, self. Tell me something I don't know. <laughs> you know? 
<laughs> and, but, you know, I came, I finally came to the conclusion that that dream about being executed was just my psyche saying, you know, this isn't what you're supposed to be doing at this time in your life. So, um, you know, you need to do something about it. And it was trying to get my attention. Um, but, I mean, I, I, what I would say is that like the tarot cards, okay, the, if you get the death card in a tarot reading, it doesn't mean physical death. It means uh, change. And literally the death card um, the death card basically says you can change the situation because the image of the naked man and woman in hell um, actually in chains, but the chains are so loose that you could just walk out of them, okay? And, and so it's about how you should, you know, you're in a situation that's got you very tightly wound, but you could walk out of that situation. And so uh, I think by and large in dreams, um, death is not about physical death. Um, you know, unless, uh, you know, unless there's actual, um, you know, cancer or something and, and you are going to die, you might dream about it then I suppose, but. Um, there's different ways to look at it, but I, I would say uh, the, the ego is involved and it could almost be a, a ego type of death, not a death per se, but right. uh, you, 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 you end up in a defeat and which we, you have the Jungian concept there of what defeat, limitation, I forget the birth. Uh, yeah. Rebirth. Contest. First yeah. thing is contest. You try right. to do something. And so in my case, I was trying to, um, get a job and I kept being defeated because I couldn't get a job, even though I tried like crazy. I mean, I wrote thousands of letters in that two year period. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, finally I got a job that was really not suitable to my experience. And I mean, it was suitable to my education because I did uh, run the finance pro program in the, in the graduate school of university college of University of Maryland for a couple of years. But so I could do it, but it wasn't really what I was meant to be. And, you know, later on, I started a company that went public. So, um, but that was not a good time. <laughs> um, but they mean something. I mean, dreams do mean something, um, but they mean something only to you, specifically to you. And, you know, my dreams about being executed were not about somebody coming to physically execute me. That's obvious, but it was saying, man, you're, you're, you're not on the straight and narrow of your path right now, guy. <laughs> I said, okay, yeah, I know that. <laughs> Let's see. So Carl says um, that his experience is that uh, the unconscious is far reaching and knows things and shows me things that seem impossible to know otherwise. And um, I think that I, um, I definitely get shown profound things in my dreams. And I recently published this dream of mine that's on the mo some of the most current videos on the YouTube channel. And the dream was about the, um, my granddaughter almost dying, uh, but she didn't. And so, but the gist of the dream was that the little girl was falling out of the bus down a steps and almost fell out, but a glass door 
stopped her and she got pulled back in, but I was out of the bus. And so then I wake up. And so here I am in the middle of the dream in which I interpreted to mean that the, the bus means life and going on. Um, and I'm out of the bus of life. And so I'm saying, oh my God, what does that mean? And so I decided to uh, carry it on uh, as an act of imagination. And the way I did that was I just um, put myself back, imagine, I imagine myself back, back at the bus stop with the bus pulling off and the granddaughter being safe. And I'm at this train station that I had been the, to the day before in the dream. So I knew this train station was there. And um, so then I just let the, let the act of imagination go. And what it did was it had me go into the station and get on a train and I was in Tokyo. So I'm going out of the train station in Tokyo and all the houses are gravestones. Okay, that's thrilling, right? <laughs> and, and then the train's going through this tunnel and as it goes through the tunnel, um, it, it ends up in the cosmos and I'm thinking about how, uh, let's see, where, where did I see this recent? Oh, I know, in the television series, Messiah, which is a very good series, I recommend it. Um, but the, the Messiah character uh, tells a young child that um, the stars are, are the souls of dead people, right? And so in my dream, I realized that the other people in my dream are dead and they're being dropped off at their stars and everybody gets off the, the train but me. And uh, then I get to the end of the line and they say, this is your star and it's extremely bright. And there's a, um, there's a train platform there. Uh, I'm not gonna tell the rest of it because it becomes political, but uh, in any case, I end up back at my hotel and safe and sound. <laughs> and, um, and so it was, a, you know, it's an interesting experience and an interesting way to continue a dream if you have a dream that, that is like that. Um, other, so, others so want to share... Oh, I just wonder if you, do you think that's a compensation uh, type of a dream or just a, you can have a, what's a complementary dream, which uh, there's a little bit of difference there, but. Uh, I, I don't know. And, yeah. and I'm not yeah. a mental health professional, so I'm not. Me neither. So. I'm not saying it means anything particularly. All I know is that um, at the end, some things happen on the platform, but then I find out that it's not my time to be at my star. And here's the train going back to Tokyo, get on it. And I go back to Tokyo and back into life and, and end up back at my hotel. Um, and so, and that, you know, literally happened in my active imagination. So I found that very comforting. <laughs> to to know that I mean if I if, if it had come out a different way I might not have been so positive I don't know um, and I I theorized there was an anima figure in that so I theorized theorized that I could get back into that scenario and let it play through some more because I did that once for eight months but. Um, so far, I haven't done so. I just haven't had the time. Um, so Carl says, another example would be my ex-wife becoming extremely upset and homesick, missing her father when she was 12 and visiting her grandparents. She was very independent and not one to become homesick. Uh, she begged her grandfather to bring her home that night. He said, if 
you still feel that way in the morning, I will bring you home. The next morning they found out her father had died of a massive heart attack the night before the time she had been freaking out. Um, you know, certainly there are a lot of um, examples of, of that and um, that sort of thing. And later in this book, Dr. Young recounts one um, that happened to him. And um, what I was going to talk about was when I came back from um, Kodiak, which was in January of 1954, my grandmother, my maternal grandmother was on her last legs and we arrived in Michigan and she was, my mother was told she immediately has had to come back to Philadelphia to see her mother a last time. And so she went with my sister and my brother and I and my father got left behind. Uh, and later on, my grand, that grandfather lived with us for eight years. And I remember at about that age, him telling the story about how my grandmother came back to him um, several times after her death. And, you know, I just knew that story and, and that experience. But then when my brother died, he came back to me twice. Um, after his death and um, how did your brother come back to you uh, well one time on the on the night after he died um, I think he died in the or the night he died um, I had a vision of some sort of conveyance like a sleigh or an open train going over my head and him somehow telling me as he went by that he was going to be okay and then the second time uh, I was in our family farm and I was dozing in a chair um, and this was maybe two months later and um, I woke up suddenly I had been dozing in this chair and I look up and, and there he is. And he said, I'm going to be fine. And he went in the bathroom and then that was the end of it. I didn't see him again. But, uh, the reason I ask you that, Skip, is because my therapist and I were talking about this just last Thursday because I had said, we I'd been talking for whatever reason about my dreams and various things and that I had had this experience when my parents died. They died in England where I was over here. Mm -hmm. And I had had that, what it seemed to me like a shooting star. It was like an orb, a sphere of some kind. Um, and it was just whizzing past me, but pausing enough time to make sure that I recognize it before whizzing past. Mm -hmm. both times and both parents. And, you know, I was thinking, you know, well, it's a therapist. He's going to say, well, you're crazy. That's why that happened, because you're crazy. <laughs> but, no, he said he'd seen the same thing. And oh, his yeah. wife had seen the same thing. So I don't I know. It's, I think it's fairly oh, common. Oh, oh, well, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, I had the same thing. Uh I had the same thing. Uh, a friend died and we were sitting in a yoga class and he was one of our class members. And it was like you said, it was an orb that just went by like this. And he said, yeah. I'm okay. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, just yeah. out of nowhere. It was, yeah. it was ephemeral, but it was almost like a, but it was so fast like that. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Exactly. Carl, Carl says this experience with, uh, his wife wa was hardly internal, but actually, um, so that's a different kind of experience, I think. I think it's a compensation for losing an, a loved one. It's, it's a con compensation, dream, vision type of thing that is very common. And, uh, you know, people, 
in the 18th and 19th century used to talk about seeing ghosts all the time. Um, and I do remember that grandmother um, talking about it, right? When, when we visited her, when I was six, I remember her talking about spirits and that sort of thing. <laughs> so, and obviously Dr. Young in this chapter talks a, a lot about different uh, spirits, but we should go on. Uh, I don't know whether we can talk about the man eater. What do you think? <laughs> I guess I'm going to do it. All right. Pardon? I see. Let's carry on. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and I've had a, I had a dream like this, but uh, the opposite sex, um, which makes me in some way wonder about Dr. Young, but anyway, in page 12 of this book or so, Dr. Young talks about a dream which he never told anybody until he was 65 years old. It was a secret. And his dream was that he went out into a meadow and there was a hole in the meadow and there was, there was a stone stairway down into a basement. And in this basement, uh, there was a room about 30 feet long and a very high vaulted ceiling. And uh, there was a throne in this room, a very ornate throne. And on the throne was um, a very fleshy phallus. Okay. <laughs> and <laughs> he, was, he was cagey about how he said it, but then he, in his, um, I guess in his dream, her mother said, his mother says, that is the man eater. <laughs> and um, we know about that time that, uh, you know, guys were getting into a lot of trouble, I think, in, with, uh, extramarital affairs that ended up um, actually killing them because they would get syphilis and uh, syphilis wasn't cured until the 1930s or something like that. And so uh, even Dr. Young's um, father-in-law, he treated his father-in-law uh, before he even uh, got engaged to Emma and um, and his father-in-law, who was a very successful businessman, um, ended up getting syphilis and, and dying of it at an early age. And um, you know, there's many stories about famous men who died early. One of them was Lord Randolph Churchill, who was. Um, uh, he was taken out the night before his wedding to the red light district of London. And he got into some things he shouldn't have been getting into and um, he got syphilis. And it happened that Winston Churchill, his son, um, was conceived in that next month before it started to manifest. And, um, and so then he didn't have relations with his wife, Jer Jenny Jerome, for the rest of his life. And she ended up being a, a gal about town, I guess. She was known for that. Um, and, um, and so in the 19th century, there was a lot of hypocrisy, and there still is about um, extramarital relations. Um, but I think his mother would have thought the man eater meant that, that <laughs> a fail is going to get you in trouble. Um, and obviously, it still can. Um, but any comments about that? So anyway, Jung dreamed about a phallus. My dream was a little bit different in that I, 
at about age five, I dreamed of a ripe full vulva being held right over my head, right above me, sort of um, levitating over my head. Um, was it a, a young vulva or an old vulva? It was a- uh, What model? It, <laughs> I would say it was a 15 year old vulva. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And very, very, very full and luscious. And, and uh, therefore I've always had a great interest in women. Um, and I remember when I was about six, getting caught playing dress up, and I mean literally dress up, uh, with a, a six-year-old girl who was my counterpart. Uh, when I was in Kodiak. <laughs> and uh, so uh, men can get into these problems. <laughs> Carl liked your comment, what model? <laughs> so <clears throat> anybody else want to come clean on any such early dreams or experiences? No. I, I had all this, the typical dreams, I think, that all boys do about sex um, at those uh, pre-adolescent adolescent and post-adolescent stages, and still do now occasionally have these fantastic erotic dreams. Mm -hmm. And I just think that, there some again, your psyche is saying something to you. Sure. Um, I, don't know, I don't think, just like you saying that the death dreams don't mean you're going to die, I don't think the sex dreams are saying that you're going to get laid or you, you need to go out and screw somebody. Um, it's just um, something more um, tangential, something more, um, it means something else. Yeah, it must have meant something else to me when I was five, that's for sure. Uh -huh. I think of sex dreams as being an indication of the coming together of two opposing forces. And I always think it's a really great sign that, that part of my individuation is, is moving forward. But I rarely have them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I rarely have them anymore. But um, anyway, OK. Moving on, uh, one of the interesting things in, in this chapter is Dr. Jung talks about his father, take, father and mother taking him out, father took him outside and showed him the evening sky and it was um, shimmering in the most glorious green. And that was the eruption of Krakatoa in 1883. So he, literally saw he was alive for that and saw the uh, original or the actual explosion. He didn't see the actual explosion, but he saw the consequences of it in the atmosphere. Um, and I know I've seen, uh, who was in, uh, uh, who's the artist, uh, Monet. <clears throat> I've seen Monet's paintings of uh, London from that year. And he's, he had done many, several um, sunsets over the Houses of Parliament, actually. And those, uh, those paintings are in the, um, the art museum and the famous art museum in Chicago, whose name escapes me at the moment. Yeah, Art Institute. Yeah, the Art Institute, right? So there's a there's a Monet room in the Art Institute, and among other things, they have nine of the haystacks paintings. And you go into that room and you just look around and do a little mental calculation. And even twenty years ago, when I did that, I said wow, this room itself is worth more than a billion dollars. 
but I do remember those paintings from that time. And his father also showed him in 1886, um, Haley's Comet um, as it went by. Now, the last time Haley's Comet came, we went out in Western Virginia to a dark place thinking we were gonna see it and I could never see it. Somebody, people said they saw it, but I didn't, I didn't see it even though I, I, I was looking for it on a clear night. But anyway, uh, Dr. Young saw it. Anyway, moving on. So he developed a distrust for women very early. Um, and this was because his, his mother was having psycho psychological problems. And, you know, I, I wonder what the nature of them was um, because um, we don't really have very good information on that. And, but she was, uh, she was very much into mysticism and uh, she came from a family of mystics and Jung's um, thesis for his MD was um, based on his uh, cousin, Hel Helene Presswick, who was, a, um, who was a mystic, a medium, she was a medium. And anyway, Helene gave these seances for a couple of years and everybody was very convinced by them. And then they stopped and she went on to be a dressmaker, I guess. But um, any thoughts about that? Well, so, I think that's, that's uh, bound to have an influence on his uh, development, and particularly since his thesis was on uh, paranormal activities, I guess, or right, right. seances. So he had that interest, and he was trying to figure out what, what was that. You know? Right. And, and in the end, for purposes of others who may be watching this in playback or whatever, um, he came to the conclusion that there was nothing nothing wooey woo magical about any of these things that you know they they are there are people who are mediums who can convince you that they're communicating with your dead mother or whatever it is or they can do past life re Regressions, or you name it, um, and so some people are gifted at telling those stories, but I don't think he would ever have said that that any of that was um, physically real. It was psychologically real, but not physically re real. Did he think they were projections? Yeah. I mean, they were, they come from the psyche and they can be very convincing. I mean, as I've explained about tarot a few times, you know, I can do a tarot reading for you and you would be moved probably by my reading, but it's, it's basically a parlor trick is what it amounts to. And I mean, it's, it's not that it's not useful. I think uh, tarot readings, even uh, today, I mean, we down on one of our corners here in Annapolis, we have a tarot uh, reader. I've never gone in to see, see her, but, <laughs> but she's got a sign up there. And uh, I think the tarot served as a kind of um, rough and ready mental health um, thing during the developing centuries, during the centuries that it developed. Um, but, you know, as I've said a few times, I can go into a theater with a thousand people in it, throw the cards across the stage, read the cards off the stage with, with no particular layout, and everyone will think that I've done a reading for them. And the reason is that they're based on 
the archetypes. And so we all have experiences with everything that's in the tarot cards. So it doesn't matter what I say because it's going to some, somewhere in the reading, in a half hour reading, something, some four or five or six things that I say are going to connect with hooks that are raw in your psyche. And you'll latch on to that. Your psyche will latch on to those things. And so I won't know what you heard in the reading. I won't know how you projected the reading, but you will think that I read for you. But everyone in the room will think that. This is what I'm saying. Yeah, you've invoked an archetype within them by the words and the cards and the symbol. Right. And it's a symbolic story like any other symbolic story. So it's going to evoke whatever archetype that comes through. It's interesting that Brendan was talking about, do you think it's a projection? Uh, which I think is a very excellent question because uh, I remember my grandmother was very psychic. And uh, when I would... Uh, when I would visit her, we would sleep up in the attic, and the attic was alive with all sorts of images dancing around, coming back and forth, to and fro. <laughs> I mean, it was a sight, man. I mean, she was just that psychic. So now, whether it's a projection or not, I don't know, but it was a nice show coming through, you know. And, and Jerem, it didn't frighten you? No. Uh-uh. No, I, we were close. Uh, that was probably my closest... Uh, uh, felt like we were soulmates, my grandmother and myself, and so you know it was just very a charming relationship. And it was very enjoyable, right? But all sorts of images would come through the attic at night, and it was just a marvelous show. So whether, as I said, I don't know if it's a projection or not, but it was real to me, right? And um, I did a reading a couple of days ago. Uh, from the chapter called Death in the Red Book. And it turns out that the, the thumbnail that I could use for that was this. I don't know if you can see that very well. Uh -huh. um, but that, that's Death, but he also calls that Atom Victu. And he's, he mentions that at the end of this chapter. Um, and so here's another, it's a picture of a carving that he did of uh -huh. Atom Victu. Looks like a totem pole or something. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a very, it, it's a scary totem pole, but um, I mean, here he did another one. Uh, I guess he calls this a gnome. Uh -huh. And then, um, anyway, one version of Atom Victu we had in his yard. So I think there's a picture of uh, his daughters standing next to Atom Victu in the yard here. Um, he's about four feet tall. And so, anyway, let's see if I can find it quickly. Anyway, I, that's symbolically that was, I, it, you know, it looks like a nasty worm is what it looks like. Um, and he considered that symbolic of death, I guess, because death often brings worms. <laughs> uh, wait a minute, if I can get the camera. Atma Victu. I'm going to have to take off here. Yeah. But uh, thanks, you guys. Good Thank you me. for being here. We'll see you another yeah. time. Yep. Yeah. Nice seeing you. Okay. Let me just see if I can find this thing. In the... Ah, yes. Here it is. Here's the picture of the Atom Victor that he carved. And uh, it's, let's see. 
carved it a number of times, but there's his daughter's in his yard with it. <laughs> well, that's more friendly looking to me. Yeah. In fact, it almost looks like a self-portrait. Yeah. Yeah, could be. Um, anyway, this is an interesting book, The Art of Sujiyo. OK, so we got through the first chapter. Then he talks about school years and how he uh, was a malingerer. And, and uh, finally, his conscious conscience came along and, and pushed him uh, because he heard his father and his uncle talking about him uh, one day. And so he, because he actually took a six month break from school um, and, and so they were very worried about him. They thought he might be epileptic and he never, he didn't speak until he was five years old among other things. That's one interesting point about Jung. And so he's acknowledging that, you know, he was a piece of work and he was very introverted. You know, he had all these secret things going on. He, he, he was building, he was drawing pictures of battle scenes and all kinds of stuff like that when he was very young. And he was, he would, you know, duck responsibility. And let's see. Well, I can remember running away from school one day <laughs> when I was probably in the second grade or something like that. I do remember that. Um, so. so in this chapter though, he comes up with his famous dream of the uh, cathedral in Basel. And um, he makes a big point about how he felt a, a thought was coming that he wanted to hold back. And for three days, he had this thought coming, 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 but he kept holding it back, trying to prevent himself from having this thought. And so finally, the thought came, this is when he's 12, I think, the thought came and it was, he saw the Cathedral of Basel and then he saw God the Father in the sky over the Cathedral of Basel in a vision. And God the Father was on a throne, literally, and drops a, uh, he defecates on the theater, uh, the Cathedral of Basel, and destroys it. Um, and that, that's the vision he had. And he said that he had this feeling of peace afterward because he saw that it was God that was forcing him to have these, these visions that you don't have to be all good, that he definitely didn't want to have that, I, that vision, but God made him do it, quote unquote. So any thoughts about that? I love that leap of faith that he had. Um, my therapist is always um, smi oh, smiles at me when I make these rash judgments about the um, goodness or badness of my various um, thoughts, actions, deeds, and all the, these things. Because you, Skip Conover, and the vast majority of people who have not uh, had to put up with uh, 50 years of Catholic repression... Um, <laughs> Don't spend your whole day judging uh, yourself as good or bad or judging how good or how, could you be better. Yeah. And uh, I, I love it that um, Jung accepted that these visions, while he was feeling bad about them, he suddenly accepted that it was God that was giving him the vision. And 
And that was grace to be and able to know that. Grace. grace, amen. It was grace. Yeah. But it's sort of, it's sort of interesting that uh, then with Faustus, with Faust, um, here's the version of Faust I'm working with here. Mm -hmm. Okay, there are many versions, but this one is the one that uh, Dr. Edinger recommended. Uh -huh. And it's quite amazing. It's translated by Walter Arndt, edited by Cyrus Hamlin, and it's called a Norton Critical Edition. And it's the second edition of it. Uh, this is a monumental work. Um, you know, I, I, I did get a, I got on Audible uh, Faust a couple of years ago, just the play in auto, Audible form. And I listened to it. It was only like three hours long. And I said, wow, that's kind of, is that all there is to it? And it, and it couldn't have been. And in other words, it had to have been edited because the actual, in this unedited version or edited maybe, but um, complete version, there are 12,111 lines. <laughs> and, and so what I got from Audible couldn't have been that whole thing. That's for sure. And, but it's interesting in terms of this grace issue that Jung, although he thought that Faust was a very good way of talking about the shadow, um, he griped that at, in, at the last instant, God, God's grace lets Faust go into heaven instead of into hell. Um, and uh, so that, that's interesting. I get, he said, I, I felt like he should have at least spent some time in purgatory. <laughs> <laughs> uh. But in this book, just to give you an order of magnitude, the main play is here, but this is all the commentary on it, which is actually, I think, a little bit thicker than the play itself and this book is over 700 pages long oh. so it's uh, it's quite a piece but among other things there's a there's a commentary on it by uh, ralph waldo emerson and a few others so i'm thinking of doing some readings out of this at least of some of the comments if not out of the play itself uh, I'm not sure I can get my mind around the translation of the play because, uh, of course, it doesn't have the proper rhyme because it was translated from German. And so in German, I understand it's quite beautiful, but in English, it's not so hot, I think. That's my impression of it so far, anyway, as I look at the translation. Um, but anyway, um, Mephistopheles in Faust is the shadow. And everybody knows that I had a Mephistopheles vision, so <laughs> we won't go into that again here um, right now anyway. So other comments about these visions in teen years? Why are you reading Faust? Uh, I'm reading it because there's a, um, there's another YouTube channel called Young Forever. And somehow the person who is uh, promoting that YouTube channel uh, found some old audio recordings of Edward Edinger and has put them on online in the last few weeks. And one of them is Edinger um, talking about 10 major points from Faust. And so he gave a, like a 75 minute lecture on Faust. It's a, it's a really remarkable and valuable lecture. And, have you and, got the links to that? Uh, do I have the links to it? I don't know if I do. 
Well, just, I mean, you can do it later. You fill in the description. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I can do that. It's, um, if you look up the YouTube channel called Jung Forever, oh, okay. I think you can probably, uh, you can probably um, find it oh. um, fairly directly. And it's Edward Edinger on Faust. Right. Yeah. You mean the author, Edinger? Pardon? I think it, yes, yes. Edward Edinger, the, the Jungian author. Um, so anyway. Um, I'll go back to Brendan's comment about go ahead. Jung's realization. Uh, and I've heard it said that before you come along, you think, things are being done to you right and at that transition point all of a sudden you are starting doing things uh, so it's a release and a new realization so i think that's a a way to look at it is that uh, as you're growing up these things and particularly with maybe the catholicism that's being done to you and then you need to give that up and you're no longer ruled by things being done to you, but you're uh, your own person. Yeah. So that's, that's the release into the awareness. Yeah. So in other, in other words, uh, Mary Oliver is right. You don't have to be good. Nope. <laughs> We, we have been guilt tripped all of our lives for something. Um, and well, it, it's, it's suppressing your archetypal function unless yeah. you figure out how to, you don't keep stamping it down because it'll explode. It's like a pressure. It's like taking a pressure cooker and putting a stopper in it and eventually right. it'll explode, you know? Right. He, he makes this comment about oneness with the Lord and he says, here was something that challenged my interest, a oneness which was simultaneously a threeness. Okay, that's the Trinity. This was a problem that fascinated me because of its inner contradiction. I waited longingly for the moment when we would reach this question. Uh, this was in his uh, con confirmation class. But when we got that far, my father said, we now come to the Trinity, but we'll skip that, for I really understand nothing of it myself. <laughs> and so this is his father, <laughs> his father, the pastor, who didn't understand it. And he says, uh, I admired my father's honesty, but on the other hand, I was profoundly disappointed and said to myself, there we have it. They know nothing about it and don't give it a thought. Then how can I talk about my secret? And... Uh, so he realized that the adults don't know anything either, okay, or uh, the theologians. And well, his experience was in conflict with what they were saying, right? And and he's had the experience, and so he realizes that hey, something's not right here, right? And then, and you know he. He skipped church as often as he could, and the last time he went to church before his own funeral was his marriage, I understand. Um, and so he didn't go to church, but he was certainly a very religious man throughout his life. Um, and he says... Uh, yeah, he was more of an apologist uh, when in his writings about religion, because he was... Uh, you know, he said, we don't give it up. We need to find the right way to, to uh, understand it in, or modernize it in terms of, of how we have that experience. Yeah, we have of, to uh, update religions based on psychological knowledge now. He said, nor did it help to accuse the devil, for he too was a creature of God. God alone was real and an annihilating fire and an indescribable grace. Um, and so, and then he says, my, my religion recognized no human relationship to God, 
but how could anyone relate to something so little known as God? I must know more about God in order to establish a relationship to him. And so he spent the next 60 years doing that. Um, and so, yeah, and he used all different ways to try to explain himself. And, uh, yeah. And I think we, if you, maybe one of them will catch you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I was, I was uh, blown away today. I, I had skipped over the prologue. And then I went back to the prologue, <laughs> like those first two sentences. Man, he really summed up about 80% of what his whole life was about in those first two sentences. Of? Pardon? The first sentences of? Of, this, of the prologue of this book. Okay, I, I'll just read them to you once again, okay. so, because you, you weren't here when I read it, read it but... Um, he, he really went right for the jugular. He says, my life is a story of the self-realization of the unconscious. Everything in the unconscious seeks outward manifestation and the personality too desires to evolve out of its unconscious conditions and to experience itself as a whole. Okay, and that's basically individuation. Yep. And that's beautiful. And there's Nancy. Uh, Nancy is on the chat anyway. And uh, she said that she would be late tonight. So uh, I, I'm just about done, Nancy. So I don't, unless you have more things that you want to talk about. I mean, uh, I have uh, something that Nancy wanted to share since she couldn't be here. Uh, okay. but we, you need to go back to when Young uh, made his little uh, uh, figure that he that he had, he put it in a little matchbox in right. his stone. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was his secret uh, from the stone. It was divide the stone was divided in half. And these are called uh, uh, charingas or charinga stones. Mm -hmm. And so uh, just to, uh, if you don't mind, I'll just show you an example of, yeah, go ahead. of what the, uh, I don't that? know, that's somebody else, it's not me. That's, that's me, I just gotta let somebody, hello. Oh, okay. Okay, hello? I want to share, can you see that? Hello? Uh, yes, okay, so there's a tring of stone. Yeah, well, the story is that Nancy was trying to paint a picture of, of what she called the divine feminine energy. And mm -hmm. she had, until she read this uh, uh, MBR here, she didn't realize, she didn't like the picture because she, you notice she drew nine spirals mm -hmm. on there. And if you look over at the Turinga stone she found, <laughs> And that was, nine. yeah, it's nine. And she said uh, she had a dream of uh, nine people in the courtroom who made decisions. And she said, well, why nine? You know, and mm -hmm. then she, she was reading a book called The Sacred Divide by Jean Benedict Raffa. And she has a section on the muses, the nine daughters of Zeus. Mm -hmm. And Ra Raffa Rice recognizing these muses muses is a metaphorical nod to the divine feminine's contributions to human thought and culture and but i think it's just super that she she drew that and she didn't realize what she was drawing so we're yeah. talking about archetypal uh, representations that are common and, and universal and archetypal right uh, and i thought uh, i thought this was just absolutely stunning the way that she recognized that she didn't even know about it until the stone and so anyway that's uh, relating to uh, i really like that though yeah um and by the way uh, i i read this seg segment that we've been dealing with tonight uh on my audible.com 
And I last week I said it was Robert Bethune who did this, but it wasn't. It's James Cameron Stewart, and it's an excellent uh, audio book, and it's available on audible.com, Memory Streams Reflections. I, I got it, and I've probably listened to this 15 times over the last 10 years, at least, the whole book. Um, and um, so I guess the next thing we need to do is to um, understand where we are, where we really have gone up against 10 o'clock again. So, um, you know, this, this is fairly easy reading. I urge everyone to look at it. If you're not a member of our Dropbox, uh, send an email to skip.conover at gmail.com and I will add you to our Dropbox and you will in there find a copy of this book if you can't afford it or you can't find it someplace. Um, you know, or you can't afford the Audible copy, you, you can uh, go to the Dropbox and there you will have it in electronic form. Um, so I urge you to do it that way. You know, I'm looking for the table of contents here, which I keep losing in this book. Hmm. I was I was thinking we would for next week go over the the next three chapters, um, which goes up through Sigmund Freud. Okay, and then that will leave for two weeks for today. Uh, confrontation with the unconscious, which is the red book, and that needs a night by itself. Well, it needs a lot more than that, but. Uh, I think we should talk about the confrontation with the unconscious as a unique thing. Okay, there it is. It is there. I'm going to mark that page. Um, so next week we will talk about student years, psychiatric activities, and Sigmund Freud. If that's okay with everybody. Yeah, I like the Sigmund Freud part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we'll, and, you know, for anybody that's watching, if you have not seen uh, A Dangerous Method, the movie, I urge you to go see that because, or see that, it's on, where is it? It's on either Netflix or, or Prime, and um, it really gives you a sense of what the relationship is like. Um, what the relationship between Freud and Jung was like at that time, which, which is a time before the Red Book period, and it's a time before Dr. Jung wrote most of his work. So he was already a psychiatrist, um, and he interacted with Freud. He also interacted with Sabina Spielrein and Tony Wolf, although we don't see Tony Wolf in that movie. Uh, we do hear about her. And, um, and so I think we ought to, uh, uh, I, I think we ought to urge everyone to see that movie um, on Netflix or wherever you can find it. Um, it's called A Dangerous Method. It was done in about 2005 or something like that. And um, it really shows you the beginnings of his uh, flailing around, trying to figure out how things worked. Um, and, you know, that included the problem of um, professionals getting into affairs with their patients one way or another and it became absolutely necessary to make that verboten so that you know you can lose your license if you if you get into a affair with your patient and you haven't sent them to somebody else you have to send them to someone else if you um, start to interact <laughs> so to say um well, he was, he was into a little mischief, we can say. <laughs> yeah, and um, 
Well, if you get into mischief, you're going to get into trouble one way or another. Yeah. Serious trouble. Um, and uh, so can't tell you what to do with your life, but uh, stuff can happen. All right. So next year, next week, we're going to do up through page uh, 169, I guess. Student Year Psychiatric Activities in Sigmund Freud. Does that sound right? Yep. And um, yeah, so it's chapter three, four, and five. Five, yeah. yeah. Okay. And then maybe we should do the work all. Well, let's just do three, four, and five. We we'll, won't we'll over rush it. Uh, but this is a fairly easy reading book, Memories, Dreams, Reflections, as Jerome is showing right now. And, um, and so we urge you to take a look at the book, read the book, and see the movie, A Dangerous Method. And there's another one called the, what, The Promise Keeper, I think is the name of the book, of uh, the movie. There's another movie, uh, I think it was made in Europe, it's about the same times, and it's called The Promise Keeper, or the, I'm, or I'm sorry, it's The Soul Keeper, maybe. Might be The Soul Keeper. Um, and that is much more about Sabine Spieler and her life. And it's very interesting movie and that you can see for free on YouTube. It's broken up into, um, I think it's six segments of 15 minutes each. So it's an hour and a half movie, um, but it's very, very interesting movie too. Uh, it's not quite as glitzy as A Dangerous Method, but it's also very well done, interestingly done. Have you seen that one, Jerome? Oh, uh, could you put those in the description? Uh, sometimes we don't get them on the chat, but uh, right. on, if you leave the chat on, but uh, you want them on the on the YouTube chat or um, a dangerous method. Well, I've seen that one, yeah. and uh, I think it's the Soul Keeper. Uh, I'm not familiar with that. And um, Nancy says this is next Monday, the first Monday. It is. Oh, I'm sorry. It won't be next Monday, two weeks from today. Because what are we, what are we going to do next Monday? Next Monday, we're meeting at Sammy's. And what are we going to talk about? I don't know. What do you want to talk about? <laughs> How much time have we got? <laughs> two or three hours, two hours at least, three hours. If you come early and come for dinner, then it's three hours. Right. Because um, I usually get there about um, about seven and have dinner with anybody that's there early. Um, so I don't know what has happened here because this on YouTube, um, we seem to have gotten cut off or something. My YouTube still working. Mine is, is too. Is it? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I see your latest, uh, this whole Kiefer, your latest uh, chat on there, and we're still. Yeah, I'm seeing. I'm seeing my chat, but it it seems to be free frozen on only you and me, Jerome, and. Um, Oh, I'm frozen. Maybe. No, I don't know. I can't tell. Are, are you seeing all three of us on YouTube? Yeah. Yes, I can see all three of us. Okay, maybe some. Oh, okay. Now I'm seeing it all. Somehow mine yeah. froze. Yeah, okay. I think mine froze temporarily. So. All right. Yeah. All right. So yeah. next week, I'll think about it, uh, Brendan, and you can give me some thoughts too. So we won't have a meeting online. <coughs> next week okay but we will have a meeting at uh, sammy's next week which will be broadcast on tuesday 
will be uploaded on Tuesday, the playback. And, um, and then two weeks from today, we'll do those three chapters. Okay. okay. All right. That's good. All right. Thank you. Thank right. you. See you next see you next week, Brendan. Thank you, Skip. See you see you soon, Jerome. I'm sure All right. I'm seeing you. All Bye. right. Peace. Peace, everyone. Peace.